Freedom in Christ. Um, last week I started the message I'm going to give tonight, and somehow we got really cut off after 10 minutes. Only God knows the reason for that. Uh, but uh, we're going to start again, and I want to expose something that that God took me through uh, for two years. I just, it was almost a cr crash course on hardcore Satanism. And I've never really gone public with what I've uh, learned during that time. And, and, and the, for the simple reason, my whole goal originally was to help people, you know, really find resolution for their problems and, and find it in Christ. And in the course of that, my own discovery, I realized that a lot of people are just paying attention to deceiving spirits. And we've clearly been warned against that in latter days. And, and so if you got... If you really want, and you really have to have a holistic answer, you can't leave out the reality of the spiritual world. And uh, so all my books reflect that uh, in terms of it. You can't look at it as just a psychological problem or just a spiritual problem or just a physical problem. It's all three all the time, I believe. And, and I think we under, need to understand that. And then when you start dealing with the unseen world, Listen to Paul's words. That which you see is temporal, is passing away. That which you don't see is eternal. And so from Paul's perspective, and I think from the Bible's perspective, the reality of the spiritual world is actually probably more real than the natural one that is passing away. So somehow we have to come to terms with that and understand it and understand how we interface with that. Uh, and let me just say up front, I, and I, nobody I don't think believes stronger than I do that to look at that, you've got to look at it through the grid of Scripture. You have to trust God that he's revealed what we need to know from the Word of God. And that's what I'm going to kind of open up for you in these next few weeks. And, uh, and I think, honestly, my motivation is I think God has clearly warned us in Scripture what the latter days will be like. And and I think we just have to be spiritually equipped to deal with that, or we're going to possibly be deceived. Jesus referred to Satan as the ruler of this world, the god of this world. He got that when Adam and Eve sinned, and uh, they died spiritually, they were separated from God, and he usurped that authority. That dominion had originally had been given to Adam and Eve and their descendants, and, uh, and I think as we search through Scripture, and keep this in mind right now, because God had to preserve that seed. His plan from the beginning was to put on planet Earth his children, his people, that he could work through here on planet Earth. I don't believe he ever gave up on that plan. Uh, although there have been so many crises that tried to snuff it out, that seed remained. And after that, he turned to the devil and said, I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, Mary originally, and between our, your seed and her seed. I personally believe, and I'm sure many others do, that the seed of Satan is literal, as is the seed of Eve and Mary. And uh, it's a literal thing. And the point is, is that, yeah, we live in a spiritual realm and that there's uh, Satan was Lucifer who fell, and uh, a third of the angels went with him, and they are a demonic horde, and through that uh, hierarchy, you know, he'd become the god of this world, and the prince of power of the air, and, and the whole world, unfortunately, lies in the power of the evil one. Keep in mind something that's just so distinct from Scripture. You have to realize that Satan is right now the god of the dead, not physically dead, the spiritually dead. Jesus is the God of the living. Uh, he is my Lord. He is my God. Uh, well, as time progressed through the Old Testament, trying to establish the law, etc., like that there, the only thing that would had to happen was for the Messiah himself, for Jesus to come. That was not clearly understood in the Old Testament. That's why the early people at the time of Jesus always looking for a messianic king. Uh, I don't believe he ever disclosed those plans clearly in the past, or probably Satan would have prevented it. Actually, what Satan tried to do was to bring about the death, the answer, the resolution, not realizing at the time that it was actually 
the answer. And uh, when Jesus said to the Pharisees, uh, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. I don't believe he was name calling there. I think that was a literal, literal statement. You are of your father, the devil. He has been a liar from the beginning. And uh, when he referred to them as vipers and serpents, uh, again, it's not a human thing, like you would call somebody a name that frustrated you or something like it. I don't think God, the nature of God, would ever do that. I think he's just clearly delineating to the fact you are a tool of the devil right now, as Judas was, for instance. But also so were some of the Pharisees. These weren't just legalistic idealists at that time. I believe there were pious Jews at the time of Christ. Scripture reveals that. But I think these people really were uh, sons of the evil one. And that's why we need to come to terms with what is stated in the wheat and the tares. The wheat are the sons of God, sown there by God. The tares are the sons of the evil ones, sown there by the devil. Tares, Darnell, my translation I'm reading right now, uh, just calls it grass. <laughs> and it looks like grass. Being an old farm boy, uh, I knew the difference between quack grass and oats and wheat and whatever else. But what's interesting about it is in the early development, you can't tell. They both just look like grass. I said, then how do you tell one from the other? Well, the wheat, the oat, the barley would all have grain. They would reseed itself. The tares didn't. And so when harvest time comes, it'll be clear. No fruit. Why? No life. And uh, well, then how does it propagate itself? Underground. Underground. It is such a clear picture, I think, of uh, the devilish nature of this world today that the first task of the devil and his demons is to remain unknown. And but once they are exposed, then it kind of reverts into a kind of a power struggle. That's why oftentimes Westerners refer to this as a power encounter, when I don't believe it is. I believe it's really, truly a truth encounter. And the answer is to be sanctified in truth. We're going to try to bear that out in the next few weeks or so. Uh, where did they pick that up from? I think really from third world countries where they're so well aware of, of the reality of the spiritual world and they're all contacting shamans and witch doctors and quack doctors and trying to manipulate the spiritual world and ward off evil spirits or try to bring healing or guidance or whatever else. And uh, so they saw this as some kind of a power contest, but it really is truth that sets us free. And that's what I want to elaborate on and clarify if I can as well. Uh, but the weeds and the tares, these are not spirits. These are people. These are people on earth who are clearly see Satan as their father. Uh, when I first got introduced to this, I mean, I didn't go looking for it. I promise you, people, there wasn't a curious bone on my body about that part of reality. I just dismissed it. I was an engineer. I was so left brain, my head tilted on one side. But God started to bring it to me. And it started with a, a man named Harry um, called me and asked if he could meet with me and a backslidden lady came with him that he was renting a room from in her house and and uh, it was a Saturday afternoon uh, and he introduced himself he said I was raised in Satanism uh, from the time he could remember my mom is a high priest and he just wanted out of it for whatever reason and uh, I didn't know whether to believe that or not but truth is at that time I didn't particularly care to proceed any further unless I had some really good prayer support. It was Saturday at the church at that time. And I, and uh, so I looked around and custodian was there. And I said, Wayne, I just need you as a prayer partner. And uh, just come. You don't have to say anything, do anything. Just appreciate. And partly, I think, as a witness. Because I wasn't sure what was going to happen. And I told him, I said, you can't just leave Satanism. You would still be in it. You have to come to Christ. And... Uh, I said, are you prepared to do that? And boy, he started to answer affirmatively. And then something you'd probably see in a movie took place. And uh, my friend Wayne probably will never forget this day as long as he lives. And if there was a door at that end of the room, he probably would have taken it. 
But fortunately, I had enough experience at that time to just sit back and realize that I'm a child of God. The evil one can't touch me. So I just picked up Ephesians chapter 1 and all the wonderful things that we have in Christ, and I just started to put his name into it. And finally, he was just pancaked out on the ground. And probably the most humble decision I've ever seen in my life. Just, Lord, Jesus, I need you. And it's whew, like it just collapsed. Now, you need to understand something, folks. For this poor man, that was a beginning. That was not an end. In fact, what he went through for the next few months was just absolutely horrific. Uh, spiritual attacks, people attacks. It, it was uh, really amazing. But I asked him, I said, you know, I get asked questions all the time about symbols and whatever else. And, you know, can you uh, acquaint me with those? And he came back two days later with two pages. And I said, I didn't see any of that stuff. I was expecting goat heads and pentagrams and that kind of thing, the typical stuff. But he had what he called the seven seals of the seven covens of the world. And according to him, I, this is in fact, folks, this is just telling you my story here. Uh, but there was basically a kind of a, a global network. And uh, there was one over Africa, one over Asia, one over Europe, uh, South America, England by itself, and United States too, east and west. And I thought, boy, that is intriguing. And... Uh, well, what do you do with that? And he, he swore me not that I would not go public with that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I can tell you that story, but I didn't want to show anybody that stuff. Well, about that time, a counselor in our area called me and said, you know, I've never given any room for the demonic, but maybe, maybe, uh, this is her problem. Could you come over and provide some assessment? <laughs> I was absolutely flabbergasted. I said, if you can't see it here, you know, you'll never see it. And I said, honey, there's a spiritual battle going on for your mind. And she, oh, praise God. She said, somebody finally knows and, and understands. And she just broke it off. Four years of counseling had led absolutely no, and it would lead nowhere. And um, so she came in to see me and started to tell me her story. Uh, she always wore sweatshirts because of the cuts on her arms and whatever else. But she would wake up in the morning with cuts on her and had no idea how they got there. Uh, no recollection, no memory of it whatsoever. And so I saw her a couple of times, and I was this was a learning curve of my life at that time because I, what I've developed and is, have available to the public today was just being in its early stages. And so... Uh, she came in one day and I said, you have any more cuts or marks? And she said, yes. And uh, she rolled up her place so I could see one on her shoulder. And I took those things that Harry had given me and because it looked like an odd kind of a thing cut into her skin and so I looked at it and unbeknownst to me, she, she looked over my shoulder and she just almost screamed. She said, what is that? Where did you get that? And uh, what she was looking at was the supposedly seal for Western United States. I said, where have you seen that? Right here. Apparently it was on her chest, and uh, I never saw that. But uh, uh, another week she came in, and I said, anything else? And yes, yeah, she pulled up her pant leg. And I, I, don't even, I can't really even explain how they could do it. But, but there was a pentagram cut under her skin with a cobra head coming out of it. I took a picture of it. And I, I mean, there was a little Missouri in me, and I just said, what in the world is this? And uh, uh, it wasn't drawn on. It wasn't a tattoo. There was no ink in it like it there. It was like a scratch that stayed there, by the way. It didn't go away. In fact, got expanded on uh, a little later at... Um, and they started to become aware, the uh, doctor that she was seeing, that she was having these night trips. And so they uh, put her in the hospital to try to monitor her sleep, and they couldn't keep her there. I mean, I found this hard to believe, too, so if you are, you know, I understand that. But they finally stationed a guard there. But she would somehow get out every night, and then we'd get a call a little after 3 o'clock in the morning, Say, I'm here, can you come get me? And they had no idea how they got it. Finally, they just discharged her. Well, what was odd for me was, 
that was the one and only experience that I had with a person who is actually going to rituals at night, satanic rituals at night, while I was talking. Almost all of that you hear 20 years after the fact and dealing with long-term memories, this kind of thing. And uh, uh, was she dissociating? Yeah, she was at the time. She had no memory of that. So there's a part of her brain and mind that registered all of that. So it's in her, in her memory bank, but it wasn't available to us at that time. And it, it was very sobering to realize that. Well, in the next probably two years, I had uh, two other people that uh, identified with that thing. And so for me, it was all of a sudden, and they were unrelated to each other, or at least they thought they were, uh, different parts of the city. Well, I just kind of stuffed it away. I said, what do you do with this? Um, then I had a guy come to me who uh, had an incredible story. First, a very, very attractive uh, couple came in, probably in their mid-20s, something like that. Um, you know, they could have been models. I mean, they were just a really nice-looking couple. Uh, shaped right, everything, you know, but but not arrogantly so. And uh, and he just told about his constant struggle mentally for some reason. And seemed like a very very sharp guy. I said, when did that begin? One of the things when you're helping people, when all of a sudden something happens in their life, I said, go back and to the nearest antecedent. There's always a cause and effect. What precipitated that event? That flu, you know, we do it like with food, food poisoning, you go back and what was the food? There was some food interjected that caused me to, to have this problem. But, uh, and he knew it, what it was. He, he was, uh, he had a dad, was actually a psychiatrist, but he wasn't a dad. He just really wasn't around. I mean, actually had no connection with the kids hardly at all. You know, they lived in the same house apparently, but just nothing. And um, his mom raised him. And one day he got a phone call. And the phone call uh, said, I want to meet with you. I know your dad. Uh, we want to give you a full ride scholarship. All expenses paid. Well, he was a, a sharp man, but he had no idea what that was. And it sounded like a good proposition to him. He said, well, how will I know you? Well, I know you. So he went and, uh, and met this guy for the first time. Didn't know his name. Didn't give him any information, whatever else. He said, well, what do you want? He said, well, all I want you to do, basically, is to have a sexual encounter with a few ladies as we bring them by. And it's, that's it? Uh, recruited me as a male prostitute or something? And he said, we'll give you a full-ride scholarship all the way through college, and, and uh, you won't have to pay anything. And... and uh, and he said, well, let me get back to you. So he went home and told it to his sister. And his sister blurted out, well, that's Satanism. I had no idea what her knowledge was or anything else about it. But uh, I, I kind of knew at the time. I said, yes, I think that's what it is. He was actually being recruited as a breeder. Uh, somebody who had the right dimensions, whatever else, to breed with other people. Uh, the super race kind of a thing. And uh, then I had uh, a student who graduated and, and it was a really interesting fall and I had kind of a, I was teaching full time, but also I had kind of a caseload. And um, they wanted to come in to see me. It was two policemen that went to this, my student's church. And they said, uh, we gotta tell you a story. A month ago, uh, it was a full moon on Friday the 13th. I said, yeah, I remember that. I had about three or four people calling me, wonder what's going on. I mean, I didn't know, I was kind of naive at the time, but that only happens like every two years or so. And he said, what happened a month ago was this 18 year old girl came in to the police station uh, in the city where they live and was seeking protection because she believed she was going to be sacrificed that night uh, by actually her family. It was her father. And uh, fortunately, the gal behind the desk was a Christian and took it seriously and called these two guys in. And, uh, and they were able to convince apparently the powers to be there that 
she, the female policeman, would actually go to the event with the girl that night. Now, this is the only time that I ever heard of somebody walking into a satanic ritual. And uh, <clears throat> again, I tell you what, they're so secretive, so well guarded, so protected that you, you almost never hear those stories. And, uh, and as, as soon as you realize that there was offenses there that were chargeable, uh, she signaled the people and they came in and they actually caught them in the act. I mean, there were, there were sacrifices of animals and other things like that, but serious offenses. And um, uh, so I said, well, what happened? Well, they arrested her dad and her uncle <clears throat> and, um, and the gal behind the desk that night, the female, took a leave of absence just to be with this girl because she was being phoned and harassed and not just physically, but spiritually. Uh, so uh, they wanted to know what I thought about all that. <laughs> and I'm hearing this whole story. I said, well, actually two things come to mind. Number one, you're probably going to hear some details uh, from one of those people uh, about businesses and governments and people and stuff like that. I said, believe the girl. I said, but truth of the matter is, don't believe it as truth. I, I, I said, it could be, but you'll have no way to prove it. And if you go after somebody that comes from an accusation from somebody like that, who's been in, you know, under the father of lies for all those years, I said, you could be discredited. I said, so be very careful. In fact, lay, in fact, don't dig for that kind of information. Because um, it happened with me with Harry. Harry pointed out people and get about business and whatever else. I said, people that I would actually be kind of suspicious of, but not on the, to that dimension. But what do you do with that information? And the end, uh, <clears throat> I said, well, secondly, I said, this will never come to trial. And they kind of looked at me like this and said, why'd you say that? I said, well... From what I know, I said, they won't let it happen. This won't come to trial. And they said, well, you're actually right. The uncle, I think it was, actually committed suicide in the jail, and the father pleaded insanity and uh, worked out a thing. And, and, you know, I prayed for years that all the people that I've tried to help that would never end up in a court case someplace because all you got to do is stack the jury with a bunch of non-believers, and you're kind of dead in the water. But it really created the seriousness of that. Back to Harry for a moment. <clears throat> uh, Harry was really, really went through it. Two men just came forward just to do nothing but almost try to be with him all the time. Uh, he was actually shot at. They actually went into his house, tied him up and branded him. He showed me the brand. I mean, with the branding iron. And, uh, but Harry one time took me down to the record shop and uh, pointed out, all the heavy metal at that time, the symbols that were on the carts uh, that I had actually seen in some of his drawings. I said, good grief. I said, what are you telling me? They're all Satanists? No, he said, but we owned them. Not financially, spiritually. You think there are people out there who have sold their soul for the devil to be, be popular? I said, count on it, folks. It's, it's really, really true. Well, Harry, to stop the harassment, they finally told him, apparently, uh, he called me and said, you know, they promised I would stop harassing if I stopped telling my story. And uh, I said, hey, don't do that. And I never heard from him again. I said, you don't make bargains with the enemy. Uh, you don't compromise who you are. I, I said, how will you know this? Just listen to the, what First John says. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil had been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. How many times you heard that in your gospel presentations? People, that is just as legitimate as the fact that your sins are forgiven. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's sin abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. By this it is evident who are children of God. 
And I think about it, folks. There's a kingdom of darkness, a kingdom of God. There are people who are really look to Satan, and probably unwittingly in many cases, Satan is the God of the dead. And then you have the true children of God. How do we know the difference? How do we tell a wheat from the tare? And it says, by this it is evident who are children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. <clears throat> Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount about our latter days, I believe, I believe about the church age for that matter. He said, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your names? Didn't we prophesy in your names? He said, depart from me, I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness. I think one of the things that is somewhat evident to us about people out in this world, I think there are just people who are just dead in their trespasses and sins, have no concept of Satan or whatever else, but they unfortunately are lost. And those are the ones that are probably still redeemable. I said, but you really can't tell the difference. And what do you do about it? And God says, just leave them there. It'll become evident in the end. But look for lawlessness. Look for those who uh, would try to pass laws. Uh, right now, it, it has to disturb the Christians in this country that states have actually passed laws allowing abortion up to the time of birth. And frankly, one particular governor even said that the baby could be born and the mother could still have a choice. That's infanticide. That's right out of the Old Testament. If it, if it bothers you that, that uh, some of these Pharisees were actually truly sons of the devil, then go back and read the Old Testament and see how many false prophets were there in the land of Israel. I mean, there were far more false ones than there were true ones, which is why I'm going to uh, have a talk one night on false prophets and teachers, which we've been clearly warned against will happen in the latter days. Uh, so lawlessness and, and truth telling, just tell the truth. Uh, if you're a legitimate believer and you tell a lie and you're exposed for it, you'd be remorseful, you'd, be, you'd feel Condemnation. I mean, you just feel, oh my gosh, what did I do? I just lied about something like that. Look what we're seeing today in politics. People looking you straight in the face and lying. And what's exposed is a lie. Is there any remorse? Is there any regret? Is there any retribution for it even? No, they stay in power. That's scary to me. I, I just think we're living in perilous times right now that we're not seeing righteousness. I, you know what motivated me in helping people overcome sexual addictions and chemical addictions? I said, you know, can we live a righteous life? I said, since there is a God of this world and people are being deceived and, and whatever else, I said, what's the answer for the Christian? How do we respond to a message like this? Live a righteous life. God loves you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. All the protection you need is in Christ. It is not a building, it's not a country, a place. Your protection is who you are as a child of God, alive and free in Christ. I've got a lot more to share about this in the weeks ahead because I just think we have to open our eyes and take a good look at what scripture says and don't euphemize it, don't just pass it off as something. This is the battle. It is not the coronavirus. As tragic as that is that's going on in this world today, it's probably going to just expose who are the true ones and who are non-true. A crisis like we're going through right now with the virus doesn't break us, people. It just reveals who we are. And, and uh, I think we need to keep our eyes open during this time. Trust me, there will be people who are trying to gain some advantage because of this uh, virus and the tragedy that's going on around the world. But the true Christians are out there uh, doing good deeds that God has given in their heart and knowing from the foundations of the world. But we have to have our eyes wide open. 
I'm going to spend a whole night just on what is discernment. I believe it's our first line of protection. It, it isn't just the Word of God. We need to have spiritual discernment so we can discern good and evil. Let me pray for you as I close tonight. Father, I pray, as Jesus prayed, that you'd keep us from the evil one. Sanctify them in your word. Your word is truth. There is nothing here to be afraid of. The object of our fear is you, Lord, but in a loving way, that it doesn't contradict the love of God and your care and concern for us. But someday we are going to be accountable to you. And Father, we will all want to finish this life and hear the good words, well done, good and faithful servant. And so we, may we continue to be salt and light on this planet in the days ahead. And may the sheep and the goats be separated, one that does righteous deeds, the other that practices lawlessness and lying. We are not of the Father of lies. We are of the truth and of the spirit of truth. The first thing that Jesus said about the Holy Spirit is that he would be a spirit of truth. God bless you. Thanks for listening. Uh, I think we got sober days ahead of us, but I read the last chapter in the book. We win. So hang in there. Stay faithful. Don't compromise. God bless you. Thank you for your prayerful support of Freedom in Christ Ministries. All of our content is made possible by you. Your generous support and financial gifts make these videos and our ministry possible. For more information on how to support our ministry, please visit www.freedominchrist.org and click Get Involved.